familiar with the Course in Miracles, David Hoffmeister has been teaching the Course in Miracles for almost 30 years. And, you know, I, I tell my friends, I said, David is the first man that I have ever met that doesn't have an ego. And by that I mean, he doesn't seem to come from fear of judgment anymore. He just comes from his heart and he's funny and he's intelligent and he, he's a teacher like none other. And I'm just so privileged to have him here with Francis, who's managed to make a film without knowing anything about making a film. This brilliant, beautiful film that's just all about authenticity and coming home to your heart. And that's really what the course is about. It's a, it's a shortcut to come home to the heart from, from a mind that's fearful and judgmental and doesn't even know who it is. And so I welcome you to this event. I want to let you know that there are restrooms down that hall if you need to go. And we're going to have a 15-minute break after this group if there are any questions um, and answers before the film. We'll have a 15-minute break, I think, from 7.15 to 7.30, and then the film will be from 7.30 until 9. Um, there are drinks over there and little chocolate kisses if you need something. And let's see... I hope I haven't forgotten anything, but thank you for coming, and it's all over to you guys now. Uh, thank you, Miriam. It is so great to be back here in Huntington Beach. I was here some years ago, bebopping around, going to course groups, and just uh, meeting all these lovely people. Every time I come out here to California, I just feel my heartstrings just go even faster than ever every time I just set foot in the state. And it's just beautiful to be out here. I actually picked up The Course in Miracles here in California for the first time, down in La Jolla. And, um, yeah, it was like a mind-blowing experience just opening the book for the very first time and that was in 1986 and then uh, I just dove into it I was reading the book for about eight hours a day on average and having all these amazing experiences started having mystical experiences started having revelations and revelatory experiences and then about 28 years ago, my inner guide, Jesus, said, come on, we're going on a road trip. Uh, you need to really transfer the training. You need to learn how to love everyone. Uh, you need to have, have your heart burst open and have an experience of unconditional love. And uh, so he took me on a road trip to California. Yay! How's that for our first trip? Uh, I remember pulling up here in 1991, and that was the first year of, of Jesus taking me on a five-year road trip, uh, not knowing where I was going to stay at night, or I might need to turn this a little bit. There seems to be a little bit of feedback going on with this microphone here. Maybe we could just pull it the other. That's probably good. And so, here we are. We've come back again. In 2019, for me, 28 years later, and we have a film to show you tonight. But we thought we would take this first period of time to just really dive deep into this um, experience of healing. I think every one of us, we're interested in healing. And A Course in Miracles says, to heal is to make happy. We've, some of us have wondered from time to time, there's got to be a meaning to this life, there's got to be a purpose. Yeah, the purpose is happiness. Uh, we want to know God's will for us, and our, God's will for us is perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Happiness without interruption. Happiness without an opposite. Joy, glee, just bliss. Uninterrupted bliss. And for most of us, we have to say our experience on planet Earth has been sometimes pretty uh, mysterious. Sometimes it can seem even dark. Uh, 
some of our experiences are dark and oftentimes very mysterious. But revelation is the experience of, of knowing our truth, knowing the source, knowing God, knowing higher power, whatever terms you want to use, in a very, very direct way. And in order to come into that state of mind, we have to go through a healing process, which is described as bringing the darkness in our mind, the darkness of our unconscious mind, to the light of truth within. And so, this movie in particular is a glimpse into doing that, a glimpse into that process. I started off with my road trip with Jesus in 1991, and then that was just the beginning for me because it was just round and around the United States, and then through Canada, around and around. Uh, I think the reason Jesus had me traveling is he didn't want me to have put any reliance on anything of this world. It was a way of teaching me inner guidance. Where do I go? Where do I stay tonight? What, what, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to meet? Um, I just started to get this inner connection. So whether I was staying in a hostel, a rest area, staying with a friend, I could feel this inspiration coming into me and this guidance, this internal guidance. And I have to say, as soon as I was able to get out of the, the driver's seat and into the passenger's seat and really let the spirit do the guiding and the driving, that's where the happiness started to really come in. It's when we believe we know enough from our own past learning to guide our life that we get into trouble. Yeah. Because the past is, is very dark and there's a lot of dark unconscious beliefs and thoughts that are just like interference patterns to our happiness and joy. And it's not really our destiny to be anything but happy. Uh, we are destined for happiness, and so the more we discover and tune into that healing process, the more we're able to dive into it, the, the better. Now, this movie we're going to show tonight is, is the result of guidance. So, everything about this movie comes from inner guidance. Uh, as Miriam was saying, Francis uh, is not a movie maker by trade, but she loves to pray and she loves to tune in to guidance and she loves to listen and follow. And so it just shows again, like the Bible says, with God all things are possible, as we have a motion picture now, out of just prayer and listening and following. Letting the the movie team come, uh, having a, a, a dream uh, some years ago that she would be making a movie and she would know when the team was sent. Maybe you want to just share a little bit about how that started for you. Yeah, I, uh, I think probably I want to share from uh, like even a bigger context of how I got into this whole thing because I grew up in Beijing, China as, as an atheist. I never uh, grew up with any concept or understanding uh, of Jesus or religion or God. But Jesus, a little bit of feedback, maybe, maybe we can turn that direction towards a little... Yeah, turn his mic off. Okay. But I think Jesus called me when I was in my 20s, just out of the blue. And, but the way he called me was very um, unconventional. Um, it was through the desire to, to, for healing, like David mentioned at the beginning. And one day I was in the bookstore and I grabbed a book. Um, it was something about a, a Course in Miracles, but it's not the actual book. And it says that sickness is a decision. And once you cease to see the value of it, you will be healed. 
instantaneously. And I thought, wow, I've never heard anybody has that kind of conviction about healing. And if that is true, then I want to, I want to find out about the truth, whatever it takes. So that's how I started to feel drawn to A Course in Miracles. It was really through、um, bodily healing at the beginning. But once I got into this pathway, I realized healing is is has nothing to do with just healing symptoms in the body. It it is such a big a big. Scope. I have to look at every single thought I have in my mind. I have to look at who I believe to be myself. I have to look at all the compromises in my life, and it becomes a whole journey of healing the mind. And in the end, you know, this body, as Jesus teaches it in A Course in Miracles, this body. Is a tool that can be used to extend the loving thoughts, or to be used for pleasure, attack, or pride. And depending on how we use the body, and the body reflects back, you know, whether there is it's in pain or not. So that's that's the beginning. How I got into a cross miracles and this journey of healing. And in the past thirteen、um, years, I was extremely devoted to a cross miracles. But not just the book or the concept, because the book itself is very. It can seem like intellectual. Can seem like there are a lot of understanding that's required. But really,、um, I find out that it is just a book to get us in touch with our inner guide, the spirit, the Christ, Christ self. And it takes—I mean, for me, it, it, it took the past 13 years to gradually purify the mind. Looking at the thought, expose the darkness, and it's a journey of purification. And gradually, come into this connection and this relationship with the spirit. So, about nine, ten years ago, I met David when I was living in Australia. David came to Australia to. To share about a course in miracles, and I had a very profound experience in the retreat. I felt like for the first time I actually could feel the presence of God, of Christ. And before that, it was all just concepts. So from that moment on, I decided that I would just go to live in. This monastery that is devoted to forgiveness and for the practical application of A Course in Miracles, and this monastery has only two guidelines: no people pleasing and no private thoughts. That's all that you have to live by in the monastery. <laughs> That is all, and I was extremely attracted and scared when I first heard about it because all that I I knew was my private thoughts that I didn't dare to share, I didn't dare to tell. I live in a life that I was I built for myself that I felt safe and secure, but I did not feel safe to share my private thoughts with anybody or to, even to myself. I didn't know to the kind of degree that you know. If I go deep down there, what what would I find? But I've also felt extremely attracted because it felt freedom to me. If I could live a life, no people pleasing to me means total honesty, 
total integrity, with no mask, no private thoughts implies the same. So I thought I, you know, that makes sense to live a life of total integrity, total honesty, and then see what truly is within. You know, I want to see. I want to know. So I went to the monastery um, for a, a period of time just to full time um, working on projects, use projects as a backdrop to to look at thoughts, to express, to expose the darkness, and forgive them. And after the first trip to the monastery, I went back home in Australia, and I had a dream. Where in the dream,、um, I was told that I was going to make a documentary to share this hope, because to me that was the hope that I never, I never had. All that I knew at that point was, you have to live in pain, some, you know, some kind of pain. Physical, emotional, mental, compromise, suffering, loss. You know that is the life as I knew it. And for the first time after I went through this cleansing, I realized that's not the truth. Somehow there is some reality that I hadn't tapped into, and I did. So I, I woke up with over with this overwhelming joy that I would do it. I would do it for the joy, and I would do it for the hope. Even though I I was not a filmmaker, I did not know how. But since this whole journey is to to have a relationship with guidance, to live in guidance, so that we can gradually come back. To the joy and to the identity that we are, then what better use of my life than just be guided? If Jesus is gonna guide my life, He guided me to leave Australia, leave everything behind, to live in a monastery. Then He can guide me to make a movie. I I thought, okay, that's I will. You know what I had was. I was empty state of mind. I really didn't know anything, and a very strong desire. But that was 2011,、um, and then I came to the monastery, and I was told by Jesus afterwards to wait, to not jump the gun, to not try to make anything happen, to wait for Him to direct. And to wait for him to send me the people. So it was completely、um, a journey of trust, of stepping back and let him lead the way. And yeah, just to 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 really develop that kind of patience as well. But in the meantime, you know, I I lived in the monastery full time from that point on. Um, went through many many years of using different kinds of project for the same purpose. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, all of a sudden, the team was sent. It was, you know, all the signs and symbols, and this this seeing that I have developed for for the years. To be able to spot all the signs and symbols from the spirit, told me that it's time to to start. So, yeah, that we we come here today to present not a movie but more、um, a result of a purification and 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 a message of hope that yeah that. Through purification, you know, Jesus actually said in the Cross Miracles, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. And he he doesn't mean an untrained mind can accomplish nothing in this world. He means an untrained mind 
can accomplish nothing about peace and happiness because the mind is scattered, is wandering around, is judging, is comparing, is attacking, and doesn't know who who the true identity is. So the past years in the monastery was a period of mind training, was a period of purification, it was a period of trusting and listening and following. And so today, this is uh, what we're here for, to share this, this, not just the film, but the whole message with you all. It's like a shifting of goals because in this world there seems to be so many future goals and then accomplishments seem to be accomplishments in form that you can put on your resume. And the difference in tuning into spirit and into Jesus for healing is that you you begin to realize that that your happiness and your joy is the accomplishment that you want truly in your heart. That's what you're praying for, is the happiness and the joy. And the means to that is not some kind of accomplishment in the physical plane, but it is opening your mind to spiritual vision, to spiritual sight. You might call it the vision of Christ. There's a whole new way of seeing that is true seeing that does not involve the body's eyes. There's a way of hearing that doesn't involve the body's ears. It's an intuitive listening that takes you more and more and more to this goal of spiritual vision, of, of what might be like knowing in the truest sense, truly knowing. Knowing in the way that your Creator wanted you to know. Knowing God is the point of everything. And so, it does take a lot of faith because the block to knowing, the block to spiritual vision is the ego. Is this belief system that's make-believe, it's fictitious, but as long as you give the power of your mind to fear, to doubt, to guilt, to pain, to shame, you block the spiritual vision that you truly desire. So the point of forgiveness is the undoing of the ego. It's the exposing. You don't, you don't get rid of the ego by killing it, by destroying it, by fighting it. It's an unconscious belief and you have to allow the spirit to raise it up into awareness so you can see clearly that you don't want it. Because as long as you believe in it, you will experience the witnesses to this fearful belief system. In the Course of Miracles, Jesus said, you made the ego, ego by believing in it. And you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So to me, it was one thing to study and to I had a psychology background, I was into philosophy, I read many different religions, but finally when A Course in Miracles came, it was as if Jesus was saying, now it's time to do the work. Now it's time to really heal. Give your mind fully over to this. Put your full devotion, your full attention on this, this healing and this awakening. And that's what has guided me to live a life of transparency, of, of being completely transparent. Not necessarily just living in the woods or in a cave, but to travel around. Started off coming out here to California, and then a couple countries, and then a few more. Then in 2003, overseas, Argentina, and I think I've been in about 44 different countries, and I've just kind of gone around and around the world transparently, just showing up, not knowing what I would say, not knowing what I would do, not knowing what was next, just 
be showing up, just really showing up in this moment. And that was the pathway, that is the pathway of A Course in Miracles, it's awakening through relationships. It's not just through meditation, it's not through isolating yourself away from your brothers and sisters, but it's becoming so transparent in front of your brothers and sisters that the mask just drops away. That you start to feel how natural, how wonderful it feels to, to let the love, the light in you shine forth with all your brothers and your sisters. I mean, if you really, if you look at the Ten Commandments, Jesus really emphasized the first two, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I feel like all of us know that, that there's a, a great crucible of awakening. There's a, there's a, it's primary for us to be loving and forgiving in our relationships if we want to know who we really are and we want to know God. We have to be completely transparent. Even though the first, I guess about the first 27 years of my life, I was so shy that in my senior class I was voted most quiet. In my senior class, that's what, that's what you find in my yearbook, most quiet. And then it was, it was even worse, I think, in university because I was just, I was, Afraid, I was timid, I was not transparent at all. I was like a wallflower, I was hiding out. But as soon as A Course in Miracles came into my life, it's like Jesus was saying, now let's reverse all that shyness, let's reverse all that fear, let's reverse that hiding, and let's become really super transparent. And and I didn't realize he was thinking it more on a global scale. He was not thinking small at all. And so that's actually what the movie is about tonight. It's an actual demonstration of transparency. Really the reason why people hold secrets is because they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of abandonment. They're afraid of loss. They don't want to be sharing their mind because they're afraid of sharing their thoughts. It's like they think, why do I want to share my dirty laundry list of my thoughts, my private thoughts, and lose the ones that I love? If I completely share it, surely everybody will leave my life. And they'll get to know who I really am. But Jesus is saying, well, those judgments, those grievances, those dark thoughts that you have, they aren't your real thoughts. But by hiding them and protecting them, you keep pushing them down into your unconscious mind, and they aren't going to be healed down there in that darkness. Those dark thoughts have to be given over to the light, and then they're gone. The Spirit will take them from you if you will share them with the Spirit. But if you're too afraid of sharing your dark thoughts with the Spirit, then you get to practice with your brothers and sisters. Because just your willingness to share what's on your mind, to expose what's going on, is really your sense of leaning towards the Spirit and say, okay, I'm willing to start to let these go. If you can share them with one another, then you can also begin to share them with the Spirit. And that is how these thoughts, these private thoughts are released. They are released by exposing them and offering them over. By not hiding them anymore. By not trying to hide and protect them. Many of us have done this with journaling, you know, where we just get out notebooks and we write out everything that's going on in our mind and it feels helpful to journal. Many of us have done this with a close friend, somebody you love and trust that you know they love you no matter what and you can start to expose the darkness and you feel very light when you expose the darkness to a close friend. What we've tried to do with uh, this 
monastery, which is the first Course in Miracles monastery in the world. It's out in Utah. It's about 49 acres, and it's not a cloistered monastery where no one ever speaks. It's actually a place where people can come to pray, to meditate, but also to expose what's going on in their consciousness. You know, to really let it up and, and to trust that that is part of the healing process. So, this movie really demonstrates that in practice. We had a 30-day, we called it mystery school, uh, at the monastery back in was it May of 2017, where we invited people to come, and they came from all over the world for a 30-day residential mystery school. And that's at the same time when Frances and her movie team came together. So we had a movie team there, we had all these participants from around the world that have come to dedicate 30 days of their life to this transparency, to give themselves over to this healing, to really give it a try, give it a good go. And uh, when they got there, you know, the they were given, told, well, we really would like you to participate in the movie, so we would like you to sign a release form. And some of them said, you got to be kidding. I'm coming <laughs> here to pour my heart out, and you want to film? <laughs> film my face while I'm crying. <laughs> film my face while I'm screaming and shouting, you know, it's like, yeah, are you trying to ruin my reputation? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough to come here and be transparent with one another, but, but I don't need a film camera up my nose uh, while I'm going through some of the darkest uh, times and dark night of the soul. But in the end, the, the mystery schools, some signed the release form, some said, no, no thank you. In the end, it was actually the film crew that became the participants that would be the ones that would be going filmed, the film crew filming itself and, and practicing being guided how to use a camera, how to capture the footage, learning cinematography, learning the equipment, and also going through very raw emotions of of this healing process. And that's really what was captured. And I think all in all there was about 300 hours of footage that was shot during these 30 days. And then came a very long editing process which was through prayer and guidance really coming down to an hour and 20 minute movie from over 300 hours of footage that the Spirit would use to show the healing process, to show the value of allowing these emotions up. Basically, we all know from our experiences that we can experience some of the most amazing connections, the most amazing love through our relationships, but we also know that there is so much darkness that can come up in these intimate relationships. And in that sense, what the relationships are revealing to us as, the, as human beings is that they are revealing to us much of what is in our unconscious mind. Much of what we've, we refuse to admit to ourselves that we believe in. We, refuse to admit to ourselves that we're thinking. The relationships give us the benefit of showing us this, these thoughts, these beliefs reflected, these emotions reflected back to us. And so in that sense we should feel such indebtedness, so much gratitude to all of our brothers and sisters for reflecting back to us what we have denied from ourselves. To come to planet Earth in time and space is like playing a giant cosmic game of hide and seek. <laughs> we are playing a big hide and seek with God. And when we come into time and space, 
we are distracted by many things, many idols, many temptations, many things that catch our attention, our focus, that are not loving. And we have many things even in this world that are actually an attraction to guilt, except we don't know it. We actually think we're pursuing something that is that will bring us pleasure, not realizing that the very thing that we've held up and are pursuing to bring us pleasure will also bring us pain. It's like a sneaky trick. This whole world is full of many deceptions. But through our transparency and through our willingness to be shown by the Spirit how to forgive, we start to realize that when we forgive, we're not actually forgiving the person for what they did to us that we think they shouldn't have done, or that they didn't do for us what we think they should have done for us. We're actually releasing the expectations that we hold of all of our brothers and sisters. It's the expectations that set up the grievances. And if we could learn to accept fully each other for who we truly are, and drop the judgment, and drop the expectations, you do find that you feel happy, you feel free, you feel joyful. In my life, I had gone through 10 years of university, and I was getting prepared for a career, and I was on the same pathway that many human beings are, you know, making a name for myself, using my education to build a job, build a career, build an identity in the world. And then suddenly, about um, over 30 years ago, you might say that Jesus intercepted my plan for my life. He intercepted it. He was like, no, you have a, you have a higher purpose. Your life is to be lived for the good of everyone in the universe, not for David. There's something more important than the personality self. There is a universal plan and there is a universal will to know God's joy and happiness that is most important. And it was by choice. I did say, I give it all over. Take, take everything that seems to be me and my world and you use it for your purposes. And that has been, talk about the ride of a lifetime, what an adventure. Forty some countries, round and around the world, meeting thousands of people. When I was voted most shy, most quiet in my senior class, I don't know, intercepted is a good word, the whole life destiny was literally intercepted by the Spirit and taken in a whole new direction. Yes, I did. I did give up my career, but at the time when I was letting go of career, of future goals, of things, I, how I wanted my life to turn out, there was some, still some fear and trepidation like, well, how am I actually going to be provided for without this career. The reason I had a career and the reason I had 10 years of education was to provide for myself. And the Spirit, Jesus was saying, I will provide for you if you do the work that I give you. you know, I remember reading that in the Bible. You know, For those whom much is given, much will be required. I didn't understand what those red letters meant in the Gospels. Now I can tell you, <laughs> there's a lot that was required. <laughs> but it was very joyful. I wouldn't trade it at all. I, I, was, I was taken into realms of happiness. I actually had three revelatory experiences where it was the disappearance of the universe. Literally the veil of perception disappeared. And I was just in the great rays of this blazing light that's not of this world. And that was like getting a glimpse of what heaven is like. Just pure oneness, pure love. No people, no bodies, no streets, no businesses, you know, no mountains, no trees. Just blazing, blazing light. The light of truth. 
and, and when I seem to come back from those experiences, I call them revelatory experiences, I was, I was so lit up. And I was so surrendered because those were confirmations of me giving everything over to the Spirit. The Spirit was like saying, and here, I'll show you what this is all about. This is about waking up. Now this movie is an attempt to take all of you inside the mystery school. You know, you're going to see these people coming from around the world and, you know, they're it's a, they've got a little bit of trepidation, you know, what am I getting myself into here for these 30 days at a monastery? I don't know about you, but I, I never even planned to spend too much time at a monastery because I had a lot of associations around rituals and, and silence and poverty, chastity, obedience. Yikes! You know, I, I don't want to spend too much time at a monastery, but here you've got 30 people plus a film crew showing up at this modern day Course in Miracles monastery along with the rabbits, along with the chipmunks, along with the cows, along with the hummingbirds. There's a lot of creatures, St. Francis would love it out there, there's a lot of creatures that live at this monastery and they, to them, the joy and the, and the happiness is very natural. You, know, you can see it when you watch the hummingbirds. You can see it when you look in the cow's eyes. If you have a problem and you look into the cow's eyes, the cow's like, what's the problem? What's the problem here? Uh, the rabbits, you know, the chipmunks are so playful, you know, they look like they're in a Walt Disney movie. I mean, I've had chipmunks come and they will come up my leg, you know, they will take food uh, right out of my fingers because they're not afraid, you know. That to them, that's natural to live a life where they can just feel the playfulness, the laughter, the joy, you know, they feel it. And yet this is great to have that as a backdrop for spiritual healing. Because the, the animals, you know, don't really get the problem. They're like, what's, what's all this fear about? What's, why are you wearing a mask? You know, it's like, <laughs> you gaze at their eyes, why are you wearing that mask again? <laughs> do you really have to do that out here? <laughs> so that's to me the joy of, of what this movie captures because Francis was guided by Spirit to use these beautiful, beautiful nature scenes. We have um, drone footage. We have, plus you have the close-ups of the, the human faces. And you know how they say a picture is worth a thousand words. It's, this movie is pretty light on the narration and it's more like you can just see it in the faces. You can see what people are going through. You can see the darkness rising up. And it takes a lot of faith to allow that. Instead of just trying to have a stiff upper lip and stuff it down. To me that's been the, the glory of this movie. Yeah, because, I mean this movie is very much guided in terms of what is to be captured and what is to be shared. Uh, we didn't have any agenda when we started filming. We didn't know the message. Uh, we didn't come in to say, we're gonna tell a story about this. No, it, it's, it's Jesus' movie, so he will guide us to as to what to film, when to film, and who to film, and what to put together. But like David said, what you will see um, later is it's like um, a condensed version of what it takes to become truly happy, to become truly in alignment with, with the happiness and the joy of following the spirit and to know thyself. There's a lot of inner work, but it's not really up to us to direct the course would direct the journey. Um, 
the thing is, at the beginning, we had a shared purpose. Everybody who came to the monastery for that thirty days、um, came for the purpose of healing the mind, without an agenda of how it looks. They arrived and they said, "Okay, here we are. We want to live a life." Of being guided, we want to live a life of being transparent. We don't know how, but here we are. You know, I'm I'm yours to guide. So everybody, including the film team, even though on the film team a couple of people had pretty amazing filmmaking experiences, but they didn't really come to make a movie. They knew that they came to heal their mind as well. And yet, what you will see later on is is everything that is gonna be brought up by the ego when we try to follow the spirit. There is a lot of resistance. There is a lot of pride, and there is a lot of fear of following because because that means when we follow something that that is pure joy, that is pure happiness. Almost that's something we 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 don't have a past experience of. Then all this self defense mechanism comes up. I want to know. I want to know who I am. I had a lot of past experiences I can use. That's where I get approval of. You know, that's where why people love me because what I did in the past. If I don't do that anymore, I. Suddenly, I feel very insecure. So that's what you will see, because on this journey, that's why it, it is a, a walk of trust. We we don't know how it's gonna look. We set a prayer out to say, "Okay, Jesus, my life is yours. You guide me." Then all of a sudden, everything started to take its own course, and all that we're doing in this movie, you can see, is people. All that we need to do is just to dare to be transparent about the emotions that come up, and then everything is sorted. Jesus does have a plan. So at the beginning of the filming, I、um, filmed everybody's prayer because we normally come to the monastery. We start a time together. We we want to pray and we want to give our heart and our prayer to the Spirit, but. Most of us forget about our prayer as the days goes by. So when I when I was in the editing room, I actually watch everybody's story unfold, and I watch their prayer at the beginning, and I watch where they end up at the end. I thought everybody's prayer was answered beautifully. You know, even though their their defense fall apart, all the emotions come up, all the fear come up, but regardless. It's a beautiful journey of having everybody's prayer answered.、So. Yeah, I think what we discover as you go through this world of time and space as a human being is you notice that there's that there's some unconscious worthiness issues. You know, especially when you get into relationships. Do I deserve this? Do I deserve to be happy? Do I deserve to be loved? Can I love?、Uh, am I capable of love? Do I have a capacity of love? These are the deeper questions. And a course in miracles is a path where Jesus just sets the record straight, where he's saying, "No, in order to know your true love, your true self, in order to know God's love, you don't have to sacrifice anything. You don't have to give up anything real to know." Divine love. You have to release illusions. You have to release false beliefs. You have to release idols, misperceptions, grievances. You have to release attack thoughts. But one of the lines in the course that I really like is, "Your worth is established by God. Nothing you think or do or say or make is necessary to establish your worth. Your worth is established by God.、Mm -hmm. In creation, we were created perfect. We were created innocent. 
In creation there was no original sin. There was only original blessing, original love, original light. That is our birthright. That is our inheritance, is to remember this innocence. But the seeming fall from grace was just believing something that wasn't true. The ego isn't real. The ego doesn't exist in eternity, but the ego, the, to believe in the ego is to believe in this time-space cosmos. And that's why we have to learn to forgive the unreal, to release the unreal, to come back to a remembrance of the real. And so you'll see in this movie that you have a group of people that are coming together and they're taking every day takes such a willingness to be transparent, to let those darker, vulnerable emotions come to the surface, and to know that it's safe. I think Francis was recently asked, you know, what's, what is it going to take to heal? And, and you were saying it takes, it takes safety and it takes love. If there's an atmosphere of safety and love, it is natural and easy to release these false thoughts, these false beliefs. But if the mind is too afraid, then it's not ready to open up yet. It would be like a flower that's not ready to bloom yet, then love has to wait until there is a readiness to open up. There's, there's no rush with it. It's, it's like um, Jesus says, delay is unknown in heaven and tragic in time. And the reason it's tragic in time is because this need not be. You don't really need to delay. It does take trust. I remember when I first read the Course and I was reading the manual for teachers and and Jesus said, here's the ten characteristics of teacher of God. Started out with trust and then honesty, and went all the way through to open-mindedness. But he said, they're all based on trust. You have to have the trust in the Spirit to experience these characteristics. And that's been my experience. As I've learned to trust the guidance, then I realize that that's everything. I don't need to learn, I spent years in university learning economics. I spent years in school learning how the world works. I even studied uh, psychology, psychotherapy to learn how to heal my mind, except that even in psychotherapy you can only go as far as the relationship will allow, to the extent that that money is important, to the extent that things in this world are important, they will block the healing because there's still ego motives that are still there in place. But when you're working with the Spirit in your mind, there are no limits. The Spirit has no limits and you can link in with the Spirit and learn to connect and, and intuitively listen to that Spirit and then you will take, be taken up to heights of happiness where nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Nothing can disturb your happiness. It's an inner happiness. You're inner directed and you come to an inner experience of that happiness. And so you don't need people to be a certain way. You don't need circumstances to be a certain way. To me, it's been very helpful all these last 28 years on the, on the road, so to speak, because I have been amazed at how things are handled so easily and so effortlessly. Spending 10 years of, of education in university to learn how to handle this world, and then Jesus is going, okay, now that's 10 more years you have to unlearn now. On top of your, your kindergarten, your grade school, your junior high and your high school, then you pile on 10 more. But let's get going. Let's get busy now. We got to reverse. We got to undo. You got to learn how to trust. You got to learn inner listening. And you've got to let go of that reliance on, on learning. My mother was 
an educator. She, that's what she did for her profession. And I remember when I was reading the Course where Jesus said, this entire world, this entire cosmos is learned. But you never pause to ask yourself why you were learning it. You, you were created perfect and then you try to pile on a learned universe on top of that perfection, on top of that innocence and joy. And that's why you have to undo the ego. You have to unlearn the things you've learned. You have to come, become as a little child. You have to become a ch as a child, completely innocent, to know who you really are. And that's why for me, it was a process of traveling and, and being shown through miracles that I was perfectly taken care of. I remember when I hit the road back in 1991, I was only guided to drive west. He didn't say you're going to Los Angeles. He didn't tell me what the route would be. It was just, go on west. And so, <laughs> into the car I got, not much money at all, a little three-cylinder car, and I'm like thinking, oh my gosh, I'm probably going to die. But I'm going to do this because Jesus says he's got my back. But every night of that first, the first trip came to Los Angeles all the way up to uh, Seattle, Whidbey Island, across to Wisconsin, back down to Cincinnati, Ohio. That first five and a half week trip was filled with so many miracles and I was so well loved and taken care of that I was like, okay, you got my attention. It's a pretty good show you got going there. I don't know, I would have surely thought things would have fallen apart in a couple nights. But you did five and a half weeks of, uh, instead of walk about, of drive about, and uh, okay, you got my attention. And then, yeah, that was the first five and a half weeks. He didn't tell me that the first phase of this undoing and building trust would take five years. He had hit me on the road for five years. I was impressed with the first five and a half weeks. But that's again how Jesus works with you. He has to knock your socks off. He has to blow your mind. He has to blow away your, your Protestant work ethic and your idea of savings and money in the bank and personally caring for yourself to prove to you that he means exactly what he says. If you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, all else will be added unto you. But I was a slow learner, so it took me, <laughs> a slow unlearner, so it took me about five years. And then as the years passed and the miracles increased and I became very stabilized and very stabilized as happy, then it was like Jesus saying now, a lot of people who read A Course in Miracles have great difficulties with it. I want you to use motion pictures from Hollywood and spiritual commentary. I want you to use music. I want you to use a huge variety of things that most people can relate to. Because the teachings of A Course in Miracles for many are way over their head. It's just, it's so deep. But your happiness is not way over their heads. Uh, going down to South America, I would go out to the rural areas and, you know, just being a single guy out there in the rural areas, a lot of the women, the children were, they, they couldn't afford A Course in Miracles down there in Argentina, but they would have a Xerox copy of one of the chapters in Spanish and they would spend months and months just going over the Xerox copy until this guy shows up and they're a little bit suspicious. Who are you and where did you come from? But with the Spirit coming through me in like five minutes, we were all laughing, we got into the joy very quickly. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit inspires joy. You can never see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the witnesses of the Holy Spirit. You can see the faces lighting up. I had a, another, two friends of mine that they, they met when 
they met when they were like 17 years old, but they hadn't seen each other for decades. Then they met at one of my gatherings. One worked at a, a, a language school, and the other one was very good. Both of them were very good with bilingual. And they, they took me to an auditorium filled with people. And these two ladies who had re-met at one of my gatherings, one took all the Spanish translations and put them into my ear into English. And the other one took my words and put them into Spanish. So we did this big collaboration. And then at the end of the night, they said, oh, the one behind my left ear, she said, I had the best seat in the house because I just got to watch all the faces light up in the auditorium. All the smiling faces lighting up as the teachings were pouring through as the parables, as the examples were coming. And it's my hope tonight that when you watch this movie that you will feel your heart open and you will feel yourself starting to light up. Because it's one thing to talk about concepts and ideas, but you know how it is with motion pictures when the music touches your heart, when the scenes, when you just are taken and you're just lifted up beyond your personality self, and you just have a big smile on your face, like, oh yeah, this is, this is really what it's all about. That's the purpose of, of this movie. That's the purpose of coming with this movie. And in one sense, you know, when Hollywood releases a, a major motion picture, they draw a group of pe people together, they call it like a focus group, because they want to get their opinions did they like it? Did they not like it? What did they like about it? They want to take the feedback so they can tweak the film. But for you, this our focus is healing. We're going into the movie, not for entertainment, not for recreation, but because healing and love is so dear in our hearts. It's so important to us that we go, we are prepared to be lifted up to feel that lightness and that love and that joy radiating through our own hearts. So this is a different kind of focus group. We're out in California, LA area, to do a spiritual focus group with the movie. And that's quite amazing. Also, we have a, a tool online and uh, in book form that's called The Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. I used to think with all this focus on meditation and breathing and postures, there has to be a pathway to God that involves the movies. <laughs> and Jesus said, oh, there is, and I'll give it to you. And so for the past 20 years, I've been showing movies all around the world. And I have to say, in a number of those movies, with the commentary coming through and me pausing the movie and priming everybody and getting them geared up to, to see what they're going to see, people have actually had mystical experiences in the movie gatherings. And I remember I was in, um, I was in, or, or, or was it um, Venezuela? I was in Venezuela, Caracas, Venezuela, and I was showing a movie, Jim Carrey, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and I'm pausing it, Kate Winslet, and I'm letting the commentary pour through, and the whole group and I, we went to this deep experience, and then at the end of the movie, this woman came up to me with just tears streaming down her face, and she was a 14-year Course in Miracles student but she never had a direct experience of God's love. She just was reading the book and, and doing her best with the workbook, and she just had the tears pouring down, and she, she came out of the movie, she said, David, God is real. I, I, I can't believe it, it's, God is real. It was like she had had such a full-blown mystical experience inside of the movie that she said, my spiritual path will never be the same. My work with the Course will never be the same. Because it was that touchstone, it was that direct 
experience that lit her up and she knew that nothing from that day forward would ever be the same. She would never look at herself or the world the same way. That's why we have a monastery. That's why we, we have movies like the one you're going to see tonight. That's why I've written a lot of books, but um, one of them that, that involves quantum physics, The Course in Miracles and Jesus, it's called um, Quantum Forgiveness. Physics. Meet Jesus. <laughs> so, physics, meet Jesus in this book. I bring the, quant the highest quantum theories together with the mystical teachings of Jesus Christ and you start to see that science and religion are not separate at all. I know I'm preaching to the choir out here in California. You're all nodding like that. Yeah. Tell us something new. We know this. But, but this is the kind of thing we're doing now. We're just doing anything that we can do to help induce a mystical experience, a direct experience of God's love. Because once you have that, then you have something in your heart that you know is going to draw you even deeper. But for those that are just still dealing in the realm of theologies and concepts and beliefs, you know, they, they have to really keep the faith up. They really have to keep at it. That's what I did for many years. I just kept at it, kept the faith, kept the faith, and then boom, the revelatory experience hit and it was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's everything. And, and then I knew all the devotion that I'd had, all the faith that I'd had to just keep at it was, was worth it. I could feel myself almost like in Star Trek terms, beam me up. Yeah. You know, like, okay, I have, oh, okay, I feel it, now beam me up. And that's what, what this is all about tonight. Yeah, we have a roving mic. Jeffrey has a roving mic back there, so we love these to be interactive, and so we have some time to open it up for whatever questions, comments, and Jeffrey has the mic, so just put your hand up and he will come. something about quantum physics meets Jesus and can you elaborate on that a little bit more because that's me you know because uh, I understand quantum physics energy all that stuff but I want to there's a, I can't find a group of people that actually combine those two I don't know if you are it but please explain yeah actually in that particular book too, not only do I explain how, where it all meets together, but also I, I have seven either movies or there's a Star Trek episode in there, and, and I, I actually set up and really invite people to, to go and rent the movies or rent the Star Trek episode or whatever. So I, I like, am priming the pump priming the pump and then saying, let's dive in together to an experience together around this movie. I call them like quantum movies and quantum episodes. Like the movie Next with Nicolas Cage, you know, it's a very much of a, a, a quantum movie because it takes you into the experience. The first time I started getting into this idea of quantum physics meet Jesus was because I remember many years ago, I was reading a, a quantum physicist from, uh, from Australia named Paul Davies, and in his book, he was describing a quantum field, and he was describing it's all connected, it's all energy, 
and basically he had this phrase, there is no world. And I thought, well, that's a pretty uh, dramatic uh, phrase coming from anyone, but from a quantum physicist. He was really explaining that there is no world as we perceive a, a, a concrete world. He's saying that's just a trick. It's a trick of consciousness. And then I became interested and I started going back through the decades of, of quantum physics back to the beginning of the first discoverers of quantum physics. And the fascinating thing for me was, because I'm always interested in no private thoughts, no secrets, no people pleasing, was that the earliest discoverers of quantum physics, they didn't really want to publish their work because they thought they would be ostracized from science. It was so far out there. It was so far beyond empirical Newtonian physics that they just thought, our careers are over. We might as well not publish this. And so they hid it. And I thought, that's the way, what happens with most people when they have direct experiences of God or Jesus. They hide it because their congregation can't deal with it. There's even people throughout the centuries where they've had mystical connections to, to Jesus, but they, they can't share it with their mother superior or the, the other nuns or the other monks because they'll be tossed out. There was a, 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 a nun over in Poland who started seeing visions of Jesus with streaming lights coming out of his heart and his hands and his head. And she started to paint it but when she shared it with her other people in her convent, they said, are, are you crazy? And she said, well, I, I talked to Jesus and he speaks to me. And they threw her out. They literally pitched her out of the convent. So the scientists and the, the nuns and the, the monks all seem to have this thing where it's so far beyond this world that it's unacceptable. What Paul Davies said, there is no world, was what Jesus actually says in Lesson 132 of A Course in Miracles. There is no world. And he comes at it from a, using spiritual and psychological terms, whereas Paul Davies came purely from using scientific terms. The greatest discovery of quantum physics was basically that there was no external world apart from consciousness. And all the, the experiments, the, the wave, the particle experiments, and all the experiments through the years have shown this. And basically that is what Jesus is teaching with his Course in Miracles. And his whole workbook is designed to bring the mind into a, a, a unified experience, the unified field, which he calls the happy dream or the real world or, or forgiveness in which you start to realize that there is nothing apart from the mind. There is nothing apart from consciousness. That is so radical because that, that one discovery in quantum physics undoes the entire field of science, of empirical science. It undoes the scientific method. It undoes everything I learned in high school and it does learn everything that I learned in, in university because I wasn't studying quantum physics at the time, I was studying Newtonian physics. So it's almost like Newtonian physics is from a horizontal plane. You're studying from all the, getting your scientific method, all your data from, from the world. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is where science and Jesus come together, is they're, they're talking about the exact same thing. And then I started to realize that, that everything that was believed is, as far as the linear world was all mistaken, including time. That, that the world was simultaneous, the cosmos was simultaneous instead of linear. How do you relate to that in a practical way. Well, through mystical experiences, that's where you have it. And also, once you have the mystical experiences, then you, it's almost like you give over the body, your language, you give over your thoughts to that, that spirit to use. So that's why I have never, kind of like Wayne Dyer, I have never planned a talk 
you know how Wayne Dyer used to just show up? He would just show up and show up. That's what I've been doing, just showing up and showing up with no idea of what's even coming, but feeling it's for the greater good. And it's also helped me undo all these false cause-effect beliefs around sickness, around productivity, all the theories of economics in this world. It's, it's, I just decided I was going to fully go, give my life over. So, you know, I gave up career, I gave up trying to, to survive as a body, I gave up all concerns about the world and the body. Tom were all my political concerns because there's no world apart from my mind. You know, I was reading it in the quantum physicists and Jesus was saying, yeah, you know that problem you have with that politician? It's in your mind. That problem you have with society? It's in your mind. That problem you have with your neighbor? It's in your mind. There are no problems apart from the mind. And that also is what quantum physics is teaching us. It's just that it's so radical that anyone who believes even a little bit in Newtonian blocks that quantum experience from awareness. So, yeah, I think, I hope that gives you a little glimpse of it and um, if you really want to uh, give yourself a treat, there's this thing called MWGE.org. It's the Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment online. And I have done so many commentaries on so many quantum movies that it's, it's literally mind expanding and it's, it's... Some people tell me that, that if it was a choice between taking drugs, psychedelics, medicines, or watching my Movie Watchers Guide, the Movie Watchers Guide is right up there with all these other kind of mind-expanding things, but they're, they don't involve any drugs. It's just total, it's a total spirit mental experience. No chemicals are involved in these uh, amazing, expansive experiences. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, there's lots of hands, a whole row of them here. <laughs> Jeffrey's coming around. Here comes. Keep your hands up so you can see them all. <laughs> Hi, how are you guys doing? Um, Great. You speak of, uh, you know, we don't need our ears to hear, we don't need our eyes to see, we don't need our voice to speak. Now, when we do those things to ourselves, when we say them to ourselves, is that the very being, the very core, the very essence of God, of what God has made us to be? And by working the, uh, the course of the miracles, is that helping us tap into that spiritual realm of, of who we really are and, and where we're really going? Yes. Yeah, sometimes you've heard the acronym FEAR is false evidence appearing real. So these five senses that we have with our, with our, seems with our body, even though now people are having out-of-body experiences, and they're still having those five senses from a mind experience, not even with the body. But all the five senses are made by the ego. So everything that we perceive through the five senses are, are false evidence appearing real. And then Jesus is coming, swooping in to help, help us reach the Spirit. And His very first lesson in A Course in Miracles is, Nothing I see means anything. His very first lesson. As your eyes are moving around the room, you know, you're looking at the drapes, and you're looking at the windows, and the carpet, and then you look, oh, you see the family photo? <laughs> Jump a little bit. Because it's, He's just beginning to give us tools to teach us to perceive the world in, in a whole different way. And, you know, there were a lot of teachings in the Bible that were very beautiful about, about let thine eye be single. He's, he, he wants us to come to that unified perception where we forgive the world and we see, we see it more from the Holy Spirit's perspective. And then once we can go into that, then it says God will take, it's even more, than that. God will take the final step. God will lift you back into heaven once you prepare your mind and you wash it free of these judgments and these grievances, then God will, will literally take you back to divine creation. And in the Bible it says, 
the kingdom of heaven is within you. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, the word within is unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. It's who our reality is, but it's a spiritual realm. It's not a, it's not a time-space realm. It doesn't involve uh, matter and, and the cosmos. But so it's like a waking up from a dream, but first having a happy dream, first. Then, we, <laughs> Way beyond. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um, you have me so caught up and I can't get over the new secret. Okay. Just, Just like the ice cream cone, speak right in this way. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, the whole no secret thoughts thing, I can't get past that. I've never done a Course in Miracles or anything like that, so I'm wondering the question is, do you want people to just say exactly what's on their mind? And at these retreats, do people, like, I just can't get past that. Like, what if somebody says something really awful, because I have I wouldn't even have a job. So, like, is that what... I, I, yeah, just can you explain that? Like, or just the more you do this, the less judgment you'll have, so you won't have to worry about... Yeah, yeah. Well... It was interesting because one time I I did a um, I did a, a session in Hawaii on the Big Island and uh, uh, actually Francis's partner JP came to the it was the founder's house and he was like riveted on everything I said and it was like no secrets no private thoughts and so day one so he goes and uh, to expose all of his private thoughts to his girlfriend and then he comes the next day to. The next day, he said, that didn't go well at all. That really did not go well. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to be in a relationship now with what happened. And I said, well, that's why tonight's talk is on discernment. <laughs> a little late. <laughs> we, right, we had no private thoughts. The thing about it is, it's like, it's, you start off with this idea in your mind like that you would have no secrets or private thoughts that you would keep or that you would hold but you're going to let the spirit the intuition guide you on the helpful way of releasing those so there is discernment I mean certainly as you start let's say you're working a job and you have to keep some thoughts secret if you <laughs> said every single thought they'd yeah. kick you out the, yeah. the door the first first day so what it is, is as you go deeper and deeper though of exposing these secrets and private thoughts, you start to get in touch with these feelings of love that are underneath. Because these thoughts, are, these judgments are covering over a lot of love. All of us have a lot of love and light that just wants to shine through. But purification is necessary first. So what we tend to do is, like the monastery for example, the... Um, we have expression sessions where people, groups of people will come together and it's the purpose for which the thoughts that are being shared, that purpose has to become very anchored, very focused. Yeah, because it isn't really the form of saying everything that does the healing. Because you know, uh, you know, it depends on purpose of sharing. Because I, you know, if I have facilitated a lot of the expressions, and certain times people mistaken it as just to. I have a lot of attack thoughts in my mind, and I can just say it without any filter. But it's not really the form of it. But if if you say, I have a lot of judgment and attack thoughts and I'm holding and I'm because of that I have to wear a mask everywhere and I want to really forgive these thoughts and the first step of forgiving those thoughts is to be willing not to hide them as a secret so the purpose of sharing the thoughts is really f to forgive them and yet I think we all have a very thick defense mechanism. If we feel we're not in a safe place, our minds shut down straight away because there's too much fear. Then we don't want to open up with people and the healing wouldn't happen. 
So when we come together, um, we really want to do this kind of expression to start with in a group that everybody shares the same purpose. We know the context of why we're coming together to share these thoughts. It's for letting them be exposed. It's for being forgiven. And it's for the other people to hold the space and not attacking other people's attack thoughts and to hold it so that we ask the spirit to take it for us to, to, to purify it. And, but we see it is very, very important to have a very safe environment. So it's, you know, it's probably not recommended to just go on the street and share whatever thoughts you have because you wouldn't feel safe. And it's not going to be an um, experience for you to feel the healing and the purpose underneath it. Yeah, for example, I, I was traveling doing these gatherings for many years, and one time I was down in in Australia, and I I went off with a, a large group to do a healing retreat, and and then at some point after a number of days of the retreat, I just said, oh, I'm going to put up a sign-up sheet, so if anybody wants to do a one-on-one -on -one and just pour their hearts out, share whatever's on their mind, I'll be just there in a place of unconditional love. To share anything, any secret at all with me, it won't bother me at all. And then about 40 people, 40 or 50 people signed up, and I thought, man, I'm gonna have to do like seven minute one-on-ones, but that was plenty of time for people to unload. And so I had people prefacing in the one-on-ones, I've never told another living soul this, not even my parents, and then boom, they would, they would, all their darkest secrets, you know, and, and they would come out of the session, I mean, so happy. I mean, this one, a young man, I think I did a, a session with him, and he just shared all of his darkest thoughts, and his mother just said, whatever happened in that session, he is not the same person anymore, because he was able to unload, literally, his darkest secrets and thoughts within a place of pure non-judgment and total acceptance. Because I don't buy the private thoughts. It'd be like pouring it out to Jesus, you know, and Jesus just smiling and looking at you with loving eyes like, oh, I know who you really are. I'm not buying any of those thoughts. We went to China. And um, before we went to China, we had a gentleman, a friend of ours, who had translated all of my teachings from many years into Mandarin. And then they got translated to Mandarin, and then they got proliferated and passed all over the, the whole country of China. So by the time we, we go to China, we go to Beijing, and over a hundred people show up at the gathering, and then we decide we were going to do some uh, expression session groups, so I said, okay, let's break it up into small groups. We only had four facilitators, so our small groups were like 25 people. But these people had read my teachings and they were so eager to come and into that healing energy. So what they did was they, they formed a group and then I went to the group and then they put down a chair, a folding chair for me and a folding chair for somebody else. And then one by one they would leap out of the circle to jump into the, the chair with me and then jump right out so as to not take away the time of somebody else. And they were jumping in and out of the circle and pouring out. There was so much swirling energy. I think you were, a few others like, what the heck is David doing over there? It's kind of a revival. But they just so much appreciated, you know, in communist China, the, 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 the repression of thoughts was so systematic and so strong. They didn't have support groups. Even Course in Miracles groups over there had to be hidden. They, they, they would have to keep them out of the public to even have their Course in Miracles groups or their healing meetings because it was, the government was, wasn't supporting that. I did have one fellow that came to me and he, he was part of one of my deep sessions and he said, well, I don't think the Chinese government would even be bothered with you, David, because you bring everything back to the mind and everything back to total responsibility, 
to the mind. That's not threatening at all, even to the Chinese government. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a real mode of healing when you take full responsibility for your state of mind. And admittedly, it takes a lot of practice, but you'll see from the movie, you'll just, it'll be like you'll just get a glimpse, like you'll get to, to be inserted in the middle of a mystery school, so you'll get to watch how it goes. And you'll see it on the faces of the people, the intensity. Because that's what we're afraid. We're afraid that if we start letting this unconscious darkness up, it will overtake us. But the truth is, the Spirit's with us. And if we keep following the guidance of the Spirit step by step, then we, we find the people, we find the places, we find the scenarios where, where it's safe, where we feel actually safe to go through this kind of vulnerability and, and trust that we'll be carried you know, to the other side. So I think you'll get to see tonight, you'll get to see it in action, that'll, that'll help a lot. Okay. Still have a little time here. Hi David, Hi Ed Francis, thanks for coming. You didn't know when you were growing up you were going to be a priest, did you? No, I had no idea, no clue. I just want to, th these are references, but I really respect your interest in Christian science and Mrs. Eddy's work. And in the spring, they had a conference with Lawrence Doyle, who's a metaphysician and he's a quantum physicist. He's on the internet. You probably appreciate his work. And. Uh, closer. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Okay. That close? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Anyhow, I just I, I just referenced uh, Lawrence Doyle, who's a Christian scientist, quantum physicist, and I think David would enjoy listening to his research, and also Lynn McTaggart, who started the intention process, and she was I think initially in the secret. And then uh, she has really, she's very global, and she has a community that is very healing on intention. And now she's talking about moving from Newtonian physics to quantum. So it's happening, you know, in the spiritual community. People are catching on that there's something much more bigger, grander than looking at the old way that we've been pretty much conditioned. So that's really what I wanted to share. Hello, David. Uh, just the quickie, I really uh, share your interest and value in movies. And you mentioned all of these movies. I was wondering, do you have a list of these movies that I can access, and where is it? Yeah, we... We have a, a book, I think it's in its like the fifth revision, fifth because it keeps expanding since it started, but it's, I think it's the fifth edition of the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. It has kind of a greenish cover, and um, I was just up in, uh, there, do we have a copy? I don't know if we have any, but we, we uh, that one's very good if you want to read it in print. And then online, the ever-growing list is the mwge.org which it's a website mwge for movie watchers guide to enlightenment dot org and we have lots of different movies but now it's gotten so healing and so deep that I've done commentaries on many many movies from Hollywood from Bollywood from all around and now we even have an emotional index. So, for example, if you were dealing with a, an issue, an anger issue, or a jealousy issue, or envy, or whatever it is, you can go to the index and it will give you specific movies to watch to help you break through the emotional uh, stuckness that you're feeling, kind of from an emotional angle. So it's become quite expansive. It keeps expanding and expanding. But uh, you, there's the print version of the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, and then there's the online version, which people 
join in from all around the world with that. And um, it's actually got tools to, to take things into your mind um, where you actually have an upset or you have a difficulty and you, you kind of write it out in steps. Now those steps have been put into an app. So now <laughs> we have a Facebook, um, what's it called? A Facebook bot called Spiri. And we have an app for iPhones which starts off with, how are you feeling today? Gives you your name, how are you feeling? And then you work it inward into the release point in your mind. So there's even an app for the iPhone and a Facebook uh, bot that, that does that called Spiri. And so it's, it's been going for a lot of years. So we have a lot of millennials who maybe they've never heard of The Course in Miracles, maybe they've never heard of metaphysics, but they heard of this cool new app that counsels you how to release your upsets. Uh, and they're into that, you know, they, they would love to have a happy life. So, so it's kind of evolving as we, we move along. I think we might, it's 7.07, we have maybe yeah. time for one more question and then we'll take a, a bathroom break before the movie. your timing is perfect. Uh, I grew up in a little town in Minnesota, 300 people, and I've been in contact with the people of the church all through these years. My brother is going to be 90 next month, and I called him the other day and asked him a favor, and I'm not sure if I should do it or not. When my father was 46, he owned a logging camp up on the Canadian border, and he was, uh, he left camp and didn't come back that night, and nobody knew where he was. And my brother was in the bunkhouse with all the men not sleeping because he was wondering about his dad. And he said an angel came to him way from the end of the clubhouse, uh, of the bunkhouse, all the way up, and he said he was like six feet tall. His wings were uh, n not touching the floor. He couldn't see his feet. The face was so shiny, he couldn't see the face. And the angel said, your brother, your father is with us in heaven, and I will tell you how to find him. And the next morning, the Canadian police came uh, to find him, and my brother told him exactly where he was on this trout stream. And when they found him, they said, how did you know that? And he said, I don't know. So then he remembered that the angel had told him where it was. And my brother couldn't tell anybody about it. He was 15 at the time, and he thought no one would believe him. So he didn't tell anyone until he was almost 60, and my mother was in her 80s. And finally he told it. Finally he showed us that he had written it. Uh, he had put it down on a tape recording back when he was a little kid. And uh, I had said to him that I'm going to church while I'm back there. And I was wondering if before he died we should tell the story because I know the church people would probably feel very comforted to know about that, and they all knew our family. But my brother lives there and works there, and I'm not sure if he's comfortable. But if he says he wants to, do you think that would be a good idea in that little town, or do you think they'd all say, boy, has he lost his rocks? What do you think? <laughs> well, it, it seems like... We're living in an age of miracles, and, and I think it's tapping into deep down. People are crying out and calling for inspiration. And as Francis said, they're calling for hope. And, and they need to know there's something that they can have hope for, because the, their experiences in this world are so dark and so heavy that they need a witness. So I, I actually feel like that could be a very healing uh, sharing at this point, and, and I do feel like that's really for all of us, like this is, the more we start to clear out these private thoughts and these secrets, and whether it's around fear of rejection or embarrassment or whatever they are, we, we feel so good, we feel so lifted up, like we can hardly believe that we even held something in for as long as we did. So I think that that's, that would be something very, very helpful. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, many, many stories. 
Yeah, they're not. In fact, I've I've had so many people since I've been doing this work that that write to me or call me like every week, and uh, some of them are in the medical profession, you know, like an emergency room doctor, who a friend of mine named Rod Shelberg has just written a, a new book because. He was in the in emergency rooms, and he started getting all this guidance about how to offer light and healing um, that had nothing to do with his medical training. And he did kind of like Bernie Siegel uh, did. There's a famous surgeon, Love Medicine and Miracles, who basically uh, ended up leaving this the profession, the medical profession, because he had so many miracles happening that he became and his wife. Uh, before she passed away, were sharing, traveling all over and sharing. But um, I have people from all different walks of life that contact me that are going through these miraculous experiences. Many stories of angels. Uh, even my grandmother, uh, who lived to be 99, told me as I was growing up the stories of uh, the visions she saw, the things she saw. It really helped me be open on my own spiritual journey, uh, hearing those those witnesses. So I think it's very, very helpful. Beautiful. Okay, well, we have time, I think, for maybe a 15... 15 minutes break, and then we're going to come back here at 7.30, and we'll just show the movie at that point. Yay! You want to mention tomorrow morning? Oh yeah, and then uh, the movie is is one hour and twenty minutes long. So tonight this clubhouse will be needs to be logged at nine o'clock. So tonight the next session, if you can come here on time, then we start the movie on time. We will finish and then we will finish the night. Tomorrow from ten to noon, we will come back here for a follow up discussion session, we can answer more of your questions here from 10 to noon. So.